It being almost 2 p.m. in accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for members' statements has concluded, and I call the Acting Prime Minister on ministerial arrangements. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister will be away from question time today and tomorrow as he is attending the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of Parties in Paris. I will answer questions on his behalf. The Minister for the Environment will be away from question time this week, also attending the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of Parties in Paris. The Minister for Trade and Investment will answer questions on his behalf. The Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Small Business will be away from question time today, attending to a personal matter. The Treasurer will answer questions on her behalf. The Minister for Cities and the Built Environment will be away from question time this week, as he is conducting a series of bilateral meetings with international ministerial counterparts. The Minister for Trade and Investment will answer questions on his behalf today, and the Minister for Territories, Local Government and Major Projects will answer them for the remainder of the week. The Minister for Territories, Local Government and Major Projects will be away from question time today, as he is representing the Government at the Creating Healthy Cities Summit in Melbourne, and I will answer questions on his behalf. I thank the Acting Prime Minister. The member for Sydney. Questions without notice. The member for Sydney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. The Australian reports today that the Prime Minister will put innovation at the centre of his climate change agenda in Paris. In the context of negotiations in Paris, is, this still, is it still government policy to abolish the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation? The very agencies which drive innovation in clean technology. Here, here. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Member for Jagger Jagger, will cease I thank, I thank the member for her question. I understand that the Clean Energy Finance Bill is before the Senate. Is that right? Yeah, it's been rejected by the Senate. So that's that's one issue. Secondly. Secondly, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Minister for Foreign Affairs will resume her seat. Minister for Foreign Affairs will resume her seat. Already, the level of interjections is too high. I'm going to refer members to my statement of last Thursday. I will deal with a wall of noise. There's a number of people that have been warned already last week. They carry those warnings over, and the member for Jagger Jagger is warned. The Minister for Foreign Affairs has the call. I'm informed, Mr. Speaker, that it remains our policy. It's been rejected twice by the Senate, but it's still our policy. The member for Capricornia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Will the minister advise the House how regional communities will benefit from the government's Job for Families childcare assistance package? I call the acting Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable uh, member for her question. Very important for the people of Capricornia. There are around almost 10,000 children in approved, uh, receiving approved childcare uh, in, in, in her electorate from over 90 services. So it's a very significant member service being provided to the people of her electorate. The Jobs for Families childcare package uh, announced by the government includes $40 billion of funding, including $3 billion of new commitments. Uh, the increased support will mean that families between $65,000 and $170,000 being an average $30 per week better off. Better off. So families are receiving substantial, substantially improved access to childcare services and substantially improved benefits. Now, families that are using budget-based funding services, and that will include, I, I think, a number in the honourable members' electorate, they will receive subsidies now in the future, where previously that hasn't been the case. Th those located in regional and remote and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities who would, who would typically miss out uh, on receiving childcare assistance, uh, they will be eligible for support through this program. And there's $304 million for the Community Child Care Fund, a competitive grants fund to help uh, children in disadvantaged communities. 
and to, and to increase the supply of centre-based uh, mobile services, especially in regional communities. Uh, there are a number of people, though, who have difficulty, because of their geographic location, to readily access any form of childcare. And so the government is trialling a nanny pilot program, which will help to provide uh, childcare services, including for people in regional and remote communities. It's going to particularly target uh, uh, shift workers and, f and farming and rural and regional families for whom there have been no opportunities or limited opportunities in the past to have any childcare services. So this is a program about choice. It will deliver substantial opportunities for people to access childcare support regardless of their location and regardless of their financial situation. So we want this, this, uh, this program to support families who, uh, who, who wish to access childcare uh, services, who want to participate in the workforce, to give them the opportunity to contribute to their communities and to the well-being of their families. Just before I call the member for Port Adelaide, I wish to inform the House we have present in the gallery this afternoon the Hon. Telmo Longwiller, Speaker of the Legislative Assembly of Victoria. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you. The member for Port Adelaide. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is also to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. In a press conference immediately after deposing the member for Warringah, the Minister for Foreign Affairs said, and I quote, we have already announced climate targets for Paris and I expect those targets to continue. But the Australian reports today that the Prime Minister will tell the Paris conference that there is scope to consider more ambitious targets. Minister, exactly what is the position of the government? The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr Speaker, I thank the member for his question. The member for Cowan the will Prime cease Minister interjecting. reiterated in Paris and to the Australian newspaper that the targets of 26 to 28 per cent will not be negotiated at the Paris Climate Change Conference. I have a mandate from the Australian government that was passed by the Cabinet, endorsed by the party room, for 26 to 28 per cent. That is our target. That is the target that the Prime Minister was speaking about. He was not changing government policy. Government policy remains the same. Our target is 26 to 28 per cent. What he was referring to, if the member had bothered to read the article, was that it is government policy to look in 2017 at the question of the use of international units. That has always been our policy. And, in, and it is also government policy to consider reviews for all countries, all countries that sign on to reducing greenhouse gas emissions reductions in five years' time. In fact, I said that last week in an answer to a question here. That each five years, we believe that countries should review their targets, and if they are not meeting their targets, then they can, um, they can change their um, action. If they are exceeding their targets, then they can raise that as well. So it can be calibrated every five years. This has been government policy since August. The member for La Trobe has the Thank floor. you, Mr. Speaker. Members on my left will cease right, interjecting. Down. Member for La Trobe, resume his seat. Members on my left will cease interjecting. The member for Grindler, Leader of the House. The member for La Trobe has a call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is also to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Will the Minister update the House on the government's approach to the Paris Climate Change Conference and Australia's contribution to global efforts to respond to the challenge of climate change? How does this compare with other proposed approaches? Call the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for La Trobe for his question. The government is, as he knows, taking strong and effective action to reduce our contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions. We will meet and indeed exceed the existing 2020 target. Uh, we put measures in place to support the uptake of new technologies to improve energy efficiency and we will meet our 2020 target, indeed, as the Minister of Environment said, exceed. We have committed to reduce our emissions by 26 to 28 per cent from 2005 levels by 2030. And this compares well to other countries. It will reduce emissions per capita by half. So on a per capita basis, our emissions will be reduced by half. It will reduce emissions per unit of GDP by two-thirds. Australia accounts for just over 1 per cent 
of global emissions, and therefore we should be part of a coordinated global agreement that includes the major emitters, includes our major trading partners, indeed includes developed and developing countries. And any agreement must set a common basis for all countries to take action to reduce emissions, to provide transparency and accountability, and that's what we'll be negotiating in Paris, and set, as I'll say again, five-year reviews to monitor global progress. The coalition has adopted a target that is environmentally and economically responsible, and one that we're confident that we will achieve. Now, the opposition has taken the opposite approach. They have plucked a figure out of the air, a reckless pie in the sky, 45 per cent target that will be a huge hit to the Australian economy. The opposition has no idea how they'll achieve their target Member other for than through Smith. a supercharged Member for Kingsford tax. Smith will cease Under the opposition's plan, Australia's income per person will be around $5,000 lower. Member for, Member for Kingsford prices Smith is warned. 80 per cent higher by 2030. That's what the opposition are proposing. A 45 per cent target that Labor is putting forward will cost Australia's economy billions of dollars. Labor would need a carbon price of $200 a tonne to meet its 45 per cent target. Ten times, ten times Labor's failed carbon target. The Climate Change Authority modelling commissioned by Labor itself in 2013 indicates that a target of around 45 per cent would cost the economy over $600 billion. That's Labor's way. Labor's target of 45 per cent is absolutely fanciful. This government is committed to real and effective global action that will reduce emissions with a strong achievable target that will not cost jobs and will not hit the economy with a $600 billion tax. Just before I call the member for Sydney, I just remind the member for Kingswood Smith he was warned. The member for Hotham is also warned, and the member for Griffith will not interject, particularly when she's outside her seat and the Leader of the House won't interject while I'm addressing the House. The member for Sydney has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Deloitte Access Economics now says the budget has deteriorated by $38 billion. How much of that $38 billion deterioration occurred since he became Treasurer? And how much occurred during the months he was conspiring to become Treasurer? <laughs> the Leader of the House will cease interjecting. The Treasurer has the call. I thank the uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition for her question. As she would know, the uh, MAIFO statement will come out in December and that will follow uh, the September quarter national accounts, which will be released this week, and that's when the government will be updating uh, our position on the budget. Uh, she makes reference to the uh, Deloitte report that has come out today, which highlights two very significant issues which is confronting the budget. First of all, uh, the issues of commodity prices, and the other one uh, relates to the issues of, of growth in China. But the, the Deloitte report also makes another reference in there about one of the things that will be working against the, the government as we seek to repair the budget, and uh, their reference to the $17 billion worth of savings measures, which is being opposed by those opposite, Mr. Speaker. So I find it, I find it, for I find it galling that those opppositesites would seek to ask us about the position of the budget when they are standing Member between a seventeen billion dollar improvement in the budget. Mr. Speaker, because they continue to oppose measures, but they oppose far more than that. Mr. Speaker, they have they have over $55 billion worth of, of commitments and measures and things that they are opposing and commitments they're putting forward, and they've come up with a grand total of about $5 billion to pay for it. Mr. Speaker, so those opposite know what they left this government. They know what they left this government in terms of the fiscal mess that we are addressing, and we will continue the job of getting about it every day putting together policies and implementing policies that support growth and jobs, and we will control expenditure, Mr Speaker, and we are controlling expenditure. That's how you get the Member surplus, for Mr Parramatta. Speaker. Those opposite, those opposite believe the way back to surplus is to increase taxes and increase them over and over again to chase their endless appetite for spending. Just before I call the member for Indi, can I also inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon a delegation of the Council of Mayors from South East Queensland. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome. The member for Indi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. As you know, Minister, applications from Indi for round two of the National Stronger Regional Fund are in. Projects have been assessed 
and we're keenly waiting an announcement from the government. I've been asked from members of my local governments in Indi to please ask you when can we expect an announcement for this very important community building initiative. The Acting Prime Minister. Well, I thank the honourable member for her question and it's, I'm pleased that she has drawn attention to this very important initiative by the coalition government yeah. to provide support for worthwhile projects in the most disadvantaged areas of Australia. This program is, is, is an economic program rather than a social program, although it obviously has social benefits as well, but it's designed to, to help those areas that have been left behind in our nation's growth or who have suffering particular uh, local or, or, or individual difficulties. And so, as a result, the, the projects that were announced in the first round, including quite a number in the honourable members' electorate, have, uh, have been about addressing disadvantage and providing opportunities uh, in, in, dis in regional communities. Uh, the second round, as the honourable member has referred to, uh, the applications have closed. Uh, the assessment is at an advanced stage and I would expect that announcements about the successful projects in this round will be made within the next week or so. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer advise the House how important it is for the tax system to support economic growth and jobs? And is the Treasurer aware of any alternative plans that would impact on Australians who are working, saving and investing for our future prosperity? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Robertson for her question. I commend her on her own plan for the Central Coast in Robertson for jobs and growth in the local economy on the Central Coast. And a range of initiatives going right from local business opportunities through to education and others, Mr. Speaker. So I commend the member for Robertson. Mr Speaker, when, um, when, the government, when the coalition is engaged in changes to our tax system, it's about supporting jobs and growth in the economy. That's, that's our record, Mr Speaker. When last there was major changes to our tax system, uh, that resulted in taxes being cut. Income taxes were cut. Stamp duties on a myriad of issues were cut. Bed taxes were cut. Financial institutions' duties were cut. When we changed the tax system, we improved the situation of Australians by ensuring the tax system is backing people who are out there working and saving and investing. And, and this is one of the many measures that we're doing, Mr Speaker, to support jobs and growth in the economy, whether it's the Deputy Prime Minister's $50 billion dollar rollout of the National Infrastructure Plan, Mr Speaker, and our greatest trade minister of all time, Mr Speaker, rolling out the most ambitious agenda of trade agreements, Mr Speaker, or indeed the Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science and the innovation statement that will shortly be coming before the Australian people, Mr Speaker. So, Mr Speaker, we are unrolling this national platform for jobs and growth in our economy. And when you pursue tax changes, Mr Speaker, it's about pursuing growth and jobs, Mr Speaker. That's why we're engaged. And our economy does face headwinds, Mr Speaker, but we are realistically optimistic, Mr Speaker, because in the last 12 months, we, uh, and particularly in the year to June 30, we not only doubled the growth rate of the Canadian economy, doubled the growth rate of the Canadian economy, which is a comparable economy. We also saw 315,000 jobs created in the last year, Mr Speaker, which is something which is positive for the economy. Now, when we look at changes in the tax system, it is about jobs and growth. But those opposite simply see the tax system as a way to milch the Australian taxpayer, Mr Speaker. And there are alternative approaches on tax. And the most striking one we saw over the last few days was the opposition's plan to double down on the carbon tax they had when they were in government, a 45 per cent target on the reduction of emissions, which would see a carbon tax re re reintroduced to this country with full fury, Mr Speaker, with absolute full fury. It would be a carbon maxi tax that those opposite would seek to introduce to go after this 45 per cent target that Member would cost Parramatta. the economy some $600 billion, Mr Speaker, over, over 15 years. Over $600 billion, it would be an economy crunching and a job munching tax, Mr. Speaker, that would come from those opposite, from those opposite, if they ever got their hands on the carbon tax levers again. What is it about carbon taxes that they just can't leave alone, Mr Speaker? They're like that little child who just has to keep touching it and touching it. They cannot leave it alone. The Australian the people said a clear time has on expired. carbon taxes. They won't have them. The member for McMahon. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. On the 16th of June, the Treasurer said, and I quote, 
The government has made it crystal clear that we have no interest in increasing taxes on superannuation, either now or in the future. But on Friday, the Treasurer backflipped and argued that actually superannuation concessions are not well targeted, undermine confidence in the system and need to be changed. Is this another example where the Treasurer says one thing in public but organises for months other things in private? <laughs> The Treasurer has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Well, I thank the member for, for his question, and I'll refer to some comments uh, from the Premier of South Australia in a second. But if he was to be truthful about outlining my statements on these matters previously, he would know that the context of my comments related particularly to the retirement phase of, of the process, Mr Speaker. But there have been changes, and those changes have been supported by none other than the, the Premier of South Australia, who said we need a new style of leadership, one that respects people's intelligence, explains complex issues, sets out a course of action and argues the case for it. And what he was referring to, Mr Speaker, was this. Member what he was McMahon. referring to is the choice that sits between the opposition and the government. What he's referring to is he said you can sit back and be paralysed when it comes to the issues confronting this country on tax, as those opposite seek to do, uh, with their, on their, off on their smoko, Mr Speaker, when it comes to tax reform. The only thing they've come up with is a sickies tax, Mr Speaker. That's, that's, that's their approach. Their approach is to look at tax as just as a big bag of cash to chase their spending, or you can have the approach of the government that treats the Australian taxpayer and the Australian citizen with respect and understands that they are capable, unlike those the opposite, to hold will one not idea in props. their head at a time and can look at the broad array of taxes and reforms that can leave them better off. And that's what this government is doing. We are pursuing tax changes, Mr Speaker, in the spirit in the spirit of those announced and, and commended by the Premier of South Australia, the Labor Premier of South Australia, who does believe that we need to respect people's intelligence, that we do need to explain these complex issues as we are doing. Those opposite, they just jump in the bed, pull the doona over their head, and they hope it'll all go away, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, scenario three, if they want to talk about taxes, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition, and particularly the shadow treasurer, knows all about scenario three which was the option he modelled to expand the GST base and uh, increase the GST rate. But I notice, Mr Speaker, there are a lot of other plans. Maybe it's the plan B uh, that the member for Grainle is working on, Mr Speaker. Maybe he's got a plan B. Maybe the member for Sydney's got a plan B, Mr Speaker. We know the Leader of the Opposition is sticking with plan A. Has the Treasurer concluded his answer? Has the Treasurer concluded his answer? The Treasurer has concluded his answer. The member for Deakin. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Investment. And will the Minister update the House on the vital contribution that Australian exporters make to our economy across a wide range of areas and the importance of recognising their efforts? The Minister for Trade and Investment. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And, uh, I acknowledge the accomplished private sector career of the member, which has given him a, a strong trade and investment understanding. Mr Speaker, Australian exports have been a major reason why Australia has enjoyed 24 years of uninterrupted economic growth. And in fact, to, the June, to June this year, exports contributed 1.4 of the 2.4 per cent growth through to June. To this end, we've got some wonderful and innovative exporters out there. And their efforts were celebrated on Friday night at the 53rd Australian Export Awards in Melbourne. From, 50, from 74 finalists, there were 12 category winners. The finalists generated more than $1.9 in export sales in 2014-15 and employ more than 16,500 Australians. Victoria's Anchor, ANCA, manufacturer of innovative advanced machinery, high-tech tool and gutter grinders, was named Exporter of the Year and also won the manufacturing category. They are based in Bayswater North, bordering the member and the Speaker's electorates, Mr Speaker, and recently hired 160 new employees to meet their increased demand for their products. In 2014-15, Ancoc achieved 39 per cent growth in export sales and with revenue exceeding $197 million. Anchor exporting to Germany, US, Japan, China, UK and many more, is living proof that Australia has a healthy future with knowledge-based manufacturing of innovative, high-quality products. 
The other category winners were, and I think they should be, they should be recognised in this place, Mr. Speaker. Agribusiness, Austral Fisheries (WA), Business Services (Newex, New South Wales), Creative Services (Alt.VFX, Queensland), Environmental Solutions (Rubicon Water in Victoria), Health and Biotechnology (Blackmores). What a year they've had! Um, information and Communication Technology (Soprano Design), Minerals, Energy and Related Services (Blast Movement Technologies, Queensland), Online Sales (Half Brick Studios, Queensland). Regional exporter, Tasmanian Quality Meats and Small Business Bee Box for Kids in Victoria. So, Speaker, the free trade agreements we have concluded with Korea, Japan and China, as well as the Transformational Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, are unlocking unprecedented access to major markets for our exporters. And we have been and are a proud trading nation. And to the winners of the Australian Exports Awards, along with other category finalists, we salute you. <laughs> Member for McMahon. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Senior Treasury official Mr Nigel Ray has said that under the Turnbull government, Australia is experiencing, and I quote, a prolonged period of below par growth, the likes of which we have rarely seen outside a recession. Is Mr Ray correct? Is this the economic leadership the Prime Minister promised when he knifed the member for Warringah? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The member for Montgomery would be very familiar with knives, as would the member for Fowler, who seems to be his current target at the, at, at the moment, Mr Speaker. But to come to his, to come to his question— Member for McMahon will cease interjecting. He's asked his question. The Treasurer has the call. Mr Speaker, the government member is not McMahon. in denial. The government is not in denial about the fact that our economy is transitioning um, from the most significant investment boom we've seen in the mining sector into the post-boom scenario. That's, where, that's what was happening in the Australian economy at the moment. This might be lost on those opposite, Mr. Speaker, but we understand that. And that's why it's so important that we have policies in place that support growth and jobs in our economy. That's why we're doing what we're doing when it comes to trade agreements. That's why we're doing what we're doing when it comes to the rollout of our $50 billion national infrastructure plan. That's why we're embracing competition policy reforms that can drive <coughs> microeconomic growth at the state and the territory level, Mr Speaker. That's why we are engaged in the innovation statement that will be released shortly, Mr Speaker, to do all the things that will drive growth and jobs, and in particular to have a, a tax system that that backs Australians to, to work and save and invest, who are out there doing it every day. Now, that's the plan the government is engaged in. Now, the, the member opposite refers to average long-term growth and obviously includes the mining boom and those figures, Mr Speaker. Well, it's no secret to the Australian people that we've moved on from the investment boom in the mining sector. That is a very understandable position that the Australian people get and they know that they are having to work through this transition. But they are also realistically optimistic, Mr Speaker, and that's why we're pleased to see the figures that have come out today on business indicators, which show an above-median result on expectations uh, when it comes to gross operating profits. Mr Speaker. We're seeing improvement in those profits. We've seen an improvement also in wages outcomes today, Mr Speaker. the best and strongest increase for the past two quarters we've seen since June of 2012, and we've also seen an increase in inventories as well, Mr Speaker. We're getting on with the job of supporting growth and jobs in our economy. Those opposite want to put a carbon maxi tax on the, on the, on the, uh, on the economy, Mr Speaker, a 45 per cent reduction in emissions. On what planet do they think that does not kill jobs and, and slug the economy? It, it's only on, on planet Labor Green, Mr Speaker, where you actually think that you can have a, an emissions reduction target of 45 per cent and think that that won't have a devastating impact on the Australian economy, on the Australian economy, Mr. Speaker. So we will keep about our plan. We will keep about the progress we're making on these issues, Mr. Speaker. We understand the challenges that we face. We make no excuses for them. We just get on with the job of addressing them and assuring Australians can be confident that the government is doing everything in its power to support growth and jobs in our economy. The member for Solomon. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the minister please outline the government's plans to improve the care provided to people suffering from mental health issues? What has been the reaction of the sector to these reforms? The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the member for Solomon for her question and acknowledge her interest in the area of health generally, particularly in mental health. 
And we do know that one of the areas of concern is the mental health of the fly and fly out workforce. And the rationale behind these key reforms is that it won't be one size fits all delivered from Canberra, but individual locations across the country will be able to pick up the policies they need, uh, the consumer, person centred driven initiatives that will make the real difference for individuals. Uh, I have been pleased, Mr Speaker, with the response to the government's reforms that uh, I announced with the Prime Minister, Professor Alan Fells and Professor Ian Hickey, last Thursday. But I'd like to pick up on a couple of further comments that have been made by people who we take very seriously in this sector. One is John Mendoza, uh, who is actually Labor's former chief mental health adviser, a person of influence, an expert in his field and, above all else, a passionate advocate. And he described this as the most significant shake-up to mental health services funded by the Commonwealth since the beginning of the national mental health plans. It's bold, it's brave, it's visionary. What was announced today, Mr Mendoza said, responds directly and decisively to the core problems in mental health care identified in a continual 10-year public critique and published in truckloads of reports to government. And that captures it, Speaker, because the most important thing we did in announcing these reforms was to listen. To listen to the sector, to li listen to consumers, to listen to families, to listen to advocates and to understand that in designing a reform that works for them, uh, we have to and we had to hear their voices. Um, John Mendoza goes on to say, we will see an end to the sort of mental health care system that mirrors the old Soviet automotive industry, the one car in one colour and only available after an eternal wait. Others have been similarly encouraged. Mental Health Australia welcomed the response, saying reform starts today. Beyond Blue, Black Dog, the Psychological Society, the Consumers Health Forum, and today, uh, the Age newspaper, I was delighted to see its editorial headline, The Government Gets It Right on Mental Health. Mr Speaker, as I said, this is a key reform, and it's designed, first and foremost, to add the services, the professional expertise, the tailor-made, individualised care packages for people who either suffer in an episodic way with mental ill health or who experience a lifetime of differences, if I can describe them like that, in mental health and need ongoing uh, special support. Uh, I am delighted that from here on so many will be on board with this key reform and I look forward to the support of all my colleagues as we go forward. The member for McMahon. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Isn't it the case that the two quarters following the introduction of the GST in 2000 saw the worst six monthly performance of the Australian economy in the last 20 years, including the global financial crisis? Will the Treasurer guarantee that increasing the GST won't lead to a further slowdown in economic growth? Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I welcome the question because it enables me to go back over the Coalition's record when it comes to changing the tax system. Mr. Speaker, because when we change the tax system, as I've said on a number of occasions today, we cut taxes. We don't just, we, we don't just change taxes, we cut taxes, Mr. Speaker. And as a result, what that does Member is over time Sydney. that lifts the performance of the economy, Mr. Speaker. It grows the economy, and as a result, receipts will grow with the growth in the economy. Those opposite believe the way, the way to deal with the budget challenges that the country faces is to just to increase taxes. They, they just don't see a tax that they don't want to increase, Mr Speaker, and they're out there with a the high-tax cheer squad and saying Australia's got a revenue problem, Australia's got a revenue problem. What that means, Mr Speaker, every time the, 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 those outside this place hear the opposition say that Australia's got a revenue problem, this is what they mean. They don't think the government is taxing them enough. And if they had the opportunity, Mr Speaker, they would increase taxes on the Australian people for no other purpose than to chase the higher and higher levels of expenditure that those opposite have not been able to break their habit of pursuing. Their aspiration and ambition for spending is unmatched, Mr Speaker, and that's why they always want to go for higher and higher and higher taxes. Now, I, that, Remind the member for Hotham that, that she's been warned. The Howard Costello government. Now, Mr Speaker, they had ample opportunity to change all that, Mr Speaker. Despite the fact that they went to elections and said, oh, we think this is terrible and all the rest of it, did they change it? 
Did they change one iota of it, Mr Speaker? Not once. See, on this side of the House, if we go to the Australian people and we say we are going to get rid of the carbon tax, we are going to get rid of the mining tax, Member Mr Gordon. Speaker, we do it. We do it. We follow through. And what the Australian people need to know about those on that side is they will huff and they will puff, Mr Speaker, about these things, but if they ever have the opportunity, they won't do anything because they are addicted to the tax revenues that fuels their higher aspirations for spending. On this side, we will control our expenditure as we are, Mr. Speaker. Member as we for are. Those opposite are happy to make commitments without being able to pay for one. But on this side, we make sure the budget washes its face when it comes to new initiatives, whether it's on childcare or anywhere else. We make sure we put the measures in place to fund the changes Member we for wish Gorton's to do warned. for the Australian people. Those opposite, Mr Speaker, have completely, Member for Sydney. completely lost track of those important principles for managing the nation's finances. I remind the member for Hotham again. She's now been warned twice. It's her final warning. I call the member for Flynn. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Resources, Energy and Northern Australia. <coughs> Minister, as you are aware, my electorate of Flynn is home to some of Australia's most significant resources and energy projects in particular a number of major LNG projects in Gladstone. I speak with the constituents and the community leaders almost every day about the importance of this vital uh, sector. Would you please update the House on how the investment in Australia resources and energy sector is creating jobs, growth and opportunities for the constituents in my electorate of Flint? Thank you. The Minister for Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and member can I thank Gordon. the member for Flynn, member for who's Grandma. been a fantastic advocate for the resources and energy sector yeah, yeah. ever since he won a seat off the Labor Party yeah. in 2010. Now, can I say about the member for <coughs> Flynn? It was terrific to join him and the member for Capricornia and Senator Canavan at the Fitzroy Water Forum recently in Queensland to discuss a number of potential water projects, which I know the minister is focused on, Connors Dam, Nathan Dam, the Eaton Ban and the Rookwood Weirs. But it's in energy and resources that the member for Flynn's electorate is making its greatest contribution <coughs> to the Australian economy. In, the, in his electorate, there are three world-leading LNG projects, Gladstone LNG, Australia Pacific LNG, and Queensland Curtis LNG. Together, this has seen an investment of more than $60 billion from some of the biggest companies in the world, including Conoco and BG and Petronas and Cogas and others. Those three projects will produce $15 billion worth of export income every year, and over the life of these projects, a remarkable half a trillion dollars, a half a trillion dollars in export income will be created. More than 15,000 jobs in construction and thousands of jo jobs have been created once they're up and running. And in terms of supporting the local economy, some five billion dollars every year is supporting more than two and a half thousand local <coughs> businesses in the electorate of Finn. Like the uh, company MyPEC, which is a local ship repair company uh, helping to repair ships in the Gladstone Harbour. So, with the support of the electorate of Flynn and these major projects, Australia will become the world's largest LNG exporter in the world by 2020. But Flynn is also a part of Member the fantastic coal production story that we see in Australia. And this is coal coming out of the Bowen Basin, employing. 3,500 people directly and thousands more indirectly. The Blackwater coal mine, the Rolleston coal mine, the Calide coal mine. And this is good news. It good news for the people of Gladstone to Daroom, good news for the people of Blackwater to Mount Morgan, good news the, for the people of Emerald to Rolleston. Because when the energy and resources sector is doing well in Australia, the people of Flynn are doing well. The member for Adelaide. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Vocational Education and Skills, representing the Minister for Education. When will the government release the detailed modelling of its childcare package that shows who will be worse off, including how many families that rely on grandparents for childcare will lose access to the registered childcare benefit? And does this modelling include the impact on childcare? of a 15 per cent GST. 
The Minister has the call. The Treasurer and the Leader of the House will cease interjecting. The Leader of the House will cease interjecting. The Minister has the call. Well, I thank the member for her question, and I must say that this government understands the importance of childcare. We are committed to high-quality childcare for Australian families, and we certainly understand the importance of the contribution that's made by grandparents to fulfilling important childcare needs. That's why this government is investing heavily in childcare, almost $40 billion in childcare over the next four years, including an additional $3 billion, an additional $3 billion in funding, Mr Speaker. This is the single largest investment in early learning and childcare that this country has ever seen, Mr Speaker. We are targeting to support parents. It is vitally important that childcare is accessible, that childcare is affordable and that childcare is sufficiently flexible to meet the needs of parents. We want to ensure that childcare can meet the needs of Australians in the 21st century, particularly those families who are seeking to transition off income support into the world of work, Mr. Speaker. It is very difficult. It is very difficult, Mr. Speaker, to get back into the workforce if you can't have the childcare support that you need to do that, Mr. Speaker. From the 1st of July 2017, a single childcare subsidy will make make it easier Mr Speaker for parents to navigate childcare will be more affordable families will be better off those families on incomes between 65,000 and 170,000 a year will on average be $30 a week better off Mr Speaker that is $1500 $1500 a year Mr Speaker and childcare will be more flexible we on this side of the House understand the importance of flexibility. That's why we've got the new nanny pilot program that's going to help workers, particularly who work unusual hours such as shift workers, particularly those people in remote and regional locations where they are not in easy access to childcare facilities. Mr. Speaker. We have the $869 million childcare safety net, Mr. Speaker, which recognises that vulnerable children and families need extra support. Mr. Speaker. We are a government that understands the needs of this nation's families in relation to childcare. That's where we're putting in, why we're putting in place the sort of policies that are going to provide flexible, affordable childcare for parents and grandparents. Mr. The member for Cowan. <laughs> Mr Speaker, my constituency question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, Minister in Cowan, I have uh, constituents of Azerbaijani and Turkish origins, and they have contacted me and asked me about the 1992-93 Armenian occupation of Azerbaijan territory, namely Nagorno-Karabakh and nearby regions. Minister, what is the government's view on this occupation, and does the government recognise these regions as belonging to Azerbaijan? The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the member for Cowan for his question. I acknowledge the deep and consistent support that he provides for a number of ethnic communities in his electorate of Cowan. Uh, the Australian government has a long-standing policy of condemning the illegal occupation of uh, the sovereign territory of nations around the world. An example would be uh, Russia's illegal occupation of Crimea, the breach of Ukraine's sovereignty, and we were very outspoken um, on that occasion. Likewise, in the case of um, Nagorno-Karabakh, the Australian government's policy is to recognise the sovereignty of Azerbaijan. Uh, we do not recognise Nagorno-Karabakh as an independent state. Indeed, the Australian government supports the efforts of what's known as the Minsk Group. It's chaired by Russia, France and the United States. Other members include um, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Turkey and, of course, uh, Belarus to resolve the situation. It has been our consistent position that the governments of Armenia and Azerbaijan should come together peacefully to resolve the issue, to end the conflict and to end the occupied, occupied area of Nagorno-Karabakh. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Special Minister of State. I refer to the Minister's responsibility for the Members of Parliament Staff Act. As a matter of government policy, does the Minister ask the Australian Federal Police to investigate when staff members employed under that Act provide unauthorised access 
to a member of parliament's official diary. Special Minister of State. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I can inform the honourable member that that um, occasion hasn't arisen, so I haven't had the opportunity to discuss such a matter. Members on this my role. left, the member for Karangamite. There you go. You got it. I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My constituency question is to the Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science. One of the biggest issues for my constituency in Karangamite is jobs. There's strong growth in some sectors, but the biggest challenge is in manufacturing. How will our government's decision to, to establish an industry growth centre in advanced manufacturing at Deakin University in Warren Ponds and other investments help drive a wave of smart manufacturing jobs across Karangamite? The Minister for Industry, Innovation, the member for Lawler will cease interjecting, and Science. <laughs> Minister thank you, Mr. Talk. Speaker, and I thank the member for Karangamite for her question, and I can confirm to her that. Geelong has been an area which is uh, moving from an old economy approach around heavy manufacturing to a new economy, including advanced manufacturing and high-tech industries, and that the member for Karangamite has been at the forefront of supporting and lobbying for support for her particular part of Victoria and been very successful. Uh, recently, she and I launched the latest round of the Geelong Regional Innovation and Investment Fund. $11.2 million dollars worth of grants to seven different businesses. Uh, and she is quite right. She's quite right. The advanced manufacturing in the member for Riverina. Centre has recently the member for Riverina will cease interjecting. node at Deakin University at Warren Ponds, uh, which is their member first for base Land. of their advanced manufacturing industry growth centre. So Geelong is one, being well served by the member for Karangamite and two, seeing the very real effects of the, the government's commitment and investment in advanced manufacturing and high-tech industries, not only at the Advanced Manufacturing Industry Growth Centre uh, at uh, Warren Ponds at Deakin University, uh, but also in terms of the GRIF, the Geelong Regional Investment and Innovation Fund. Recently at Sykes uh, Boats, Jeff Sykes Boats, we announced a $135,000 grant that will impact on 11 new jobs in Geelong around an advanced manufacturing facility. Uh, also at Air Radiators, a $3.3 million grant leading to 30 direct jobs that will allow Air Radiators to create a purpose-built uh, new factory that will replace imported products coming from, obviously coming from overseas because they're imported. They'll be replaced by Australian-made domestic uh, uh, products that, that they're currently competing with, which is very good news for Geelong. So this all plays, of course, into the government's wider innovation and science agenda, where we are directing the economy towards new areas beyond mining and agriculture in advanced manufacturing, high-tech high -tech industries. This particularly impacts on areas like Port Pembla uh, in the member for Gilmore's electorate in South Australia in Geelong and across Victoria, in Tasmania, and we'll soon have announcements to make about Tasmania and their growth fund, which we are soon to be uh, allow, uh, having rolled out across Tasmania. So uh, next week we'll get the opportunity to announce the National Innovation Member and Science McEwen. Agenda. And I'm sorry that the opposition doesn't care about innovation and science, Mr Speaker, but the reality is we see it as a terrific opportunity to create jobs and growth. Because this side of the House is focused on jobs and growth. For That's all we care about is jobs and the growth, Minister's not the muckraking that we're about to see expired. from the member for Isaacs. Member for Newcastle will cease interjecting. The member for Isaacs has Thank the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is again to the Special Minister of State. I refer to the Minister's previous answer when I asked, does the Minister ask the Australian Federal Police to investigate when staff members employed under that Act provide unauthorised access to a Member of Parliament's official diary. The question the is not whether this event has happened. The question is how does government policy dictate the Minister should act? The Minister has the call. The Member for Chifley will cease interjecting. I've called the Minister. Thanks, need to debate Mr. The issue. Deputy Speaker. In this year of ideas, I would suggest that what I would do is take advice as appropriate and act The member for McEwen is warned. The member for Herbert. Yeah. 
Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Social, Secure, uh, Social Services. My electorate has a very mobile population, and Australia's childcare system is vital. My constituents are asking me how we can, uh, how we can make savings from the family tax benefit system and how this can help them with childcare. Minister, can you ask, outline the uh, answer to that question for me? The Minister for Social Services. <laughs> a very mobile and intelligent electorate member um, with excellent questions like that. And of course, it was the case, Mr. Speaker, that when originally the childcare reforms were designed, they were designed in their first iteration by the now Treasurer when he was Minister for Social Services, and he also bore the responsibility for finding the savings inside the family tax benefit system to pay for those uh, reforms. It's now the case because of machinery of government changes that there is a uh, Minister of Education who has taken responsibility for childcare. But, um, Member for Herbert, as you'd be well aware, um, the genesis for the changes that we've suggested for childcare, which you are well aware need to be paid for with appropriate rational savings out of the family tax benefit system, found their genesis in the Productivity Commission who noted that 165,000 Australian parents said that they wanted to and would work more but felt that they were unable or inhibited to do so because of the access and arrangements surrounding childcare. And they're the 165,000 Australians that we are working very hard for, that we have devised a plan for, that we wish to assist in engaging in the workforce. But as you've noted, Member, and as your constituents are no doubt keenly aware, that has to be paid for, uh, and perhaps it's timely if I give you a response that relates to the procedural mechanism by which that payment will occur. We had a rare event in the House last week where members opposite agreed with the savings initiated by the government. Uh, doesn't happen very often, but it did happen last week, and that savings was with respect to a mechanism to at least pay for some portion of that childcare spend. $500 million uh, odd, $525 million worth of savings was agreed to by members opposite which will see in the not-too-distant future uh, family tax benefit B uh, end for couple families uh, when their youngest child turns 13. And they will be making a contribution, $500 million worth of contribution, to sweeping reforms to childcare. Uh, it's now the case, uh, member, as you're aware, that we have the legislation that would be before the Houses this week uh, with respect to all the details on the childcare package, but that is a very significant expenditure of money and it has to be paid for. Uh, one of the benefits, member, that we have seen is that the uh, expenditure is slightly less than expended, expected, uh, that there is um, less generosity to those on higher incomes and better targeting of the childcare on lower incomes. But what I want to assure you, member, and your constituents is that whilst, whilst, uh, whilst uh, Mr Speaker, through you, whilst the, um, the childcare package needs to be paid for and whilst only part of it has been agreed to in terms of the savings by members opposite, the remaining savings will be back before this House this week with some slight modifications, and I've sent some legislation to, uh, to the uh, member for Jagger Jagger, and that revolves around excluding the small group of grandparent carers and single parents over 60, both small groups. And we've been able to do that because the spend on childcare due to the work of the Education Minister the is less expensive than we thought. The Minister's time has expired. I call the member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is again to the Special Minister of State. I refer to the Minister's answers in question time last week and today. On 29 March 2012, the Minister texted his email address to James Ashby so that he could be sent a better quality copy of the Speaker's diary. Ashby replied, and I quote, done, coming through in minutes. Did the minister receive those unauthorised copies of the Speaker's diary? Is conduct of this nature consistent with the standards the government applies to this minister's portfolio? The member for La Trobe will cease interjecting, particularly when he's out of his seat. The minister has the call. The member for Grainler will cease interjecting. Thanks, Mr uh, Speaker. And I refer the honourable member to the findings of the Federal Court, on, uh, which brought down their findings on the 27th of April 2014. Particularly, um, you might wish to refer to uh, paras 122 to 124. The member for Capricornia. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituency question is to the Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources on behalf of the attendees of the Fitzroy Water Forum recently held in Rockhampton. Will the Minister update the House on how the $500 million National Water Infrastructure Fund will aid in the construction of important water projects, including potential projects like Edenban and Rookwood Weirs, which I am fighting for near my electorate of Capricornia, 
and when will the approved projects be announced? I call the Minister for Agriculture. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for her question. The honourable member knows full well how important it is that our nation is not a nation for which dams infrastructure is something in the past. Uh, we want to be the nation that builds on the legacy of Curtin and Chifley and Menzies and goes forward with a further construction of dams, because we know that water is wealth and that, that a dam is a bank that stores the wealth. Member we know that also that through the white paper process we appropriated half a billion dollars, $500 million, towards the feasibility and construction of dams, and that uh, we have already got that process started with the states on the 19th of November and look forward to a reply by the 21st of, uh, 21st of, of January, for which they will nominate what they believe are the preferred sites. We're working very closely, very closely with the state ministers, and we've already had discussions um, in, the, in the members' electorate about Eden Barn, Rookwood, and of course Nathan Dam. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Nathan Dam has been discussed backwards and forth since 1924. 1924, and I think it's about time. And 1928 was the first time it appeared in the in the Parliament. And I think it's about time that we go a bit further than just discussing it. Eden Barn and Rookwood are not only important to the member for Capricornia, but also very important to the member of Flynn, sitting right beside her. Uh, this is part of the process of expanding our agricultural production in the area, whether it's cotton, uh, whether it's uh, to help in the industry development of Rockhampton, whether it's to help in residential development. It is this part of the process that is, makes it so crucial that our nation goes towards the construction of dams. And, Mr Speaker, I would note that uh, in the per capita megalitre of water that is stored per, per person in Australia, that we are going to be forced to an agenda of building dams, whether we like it or not. Uh, over the last uh, decades, Australia has an aversion to the construction of dams, which means that our capacity, our capacity is being reduced. But, Mr Speaker, I am very happy to be working with the member for Capricornia, because we know that the member for Capricornia and the member for Flynn are great champions, great champions of the construction of new dams in what is the, uh, the second biggest catchment after the Murray-Darling Basin, which is the Fitzroy cat catchment. We also note that it further assists in the development of our mineral resources in that area, and we know that around Tarum that is absolutely essential, for, especially for the extrata mine, that we have further construction of water infrastructure. I might close, Mr. Speaker, by stating that one of the great dreams of Australia is to move water into the Murray-Darling, to move water from one catchment to another, and the Nathan Dam would actually allow that to happen. Allow it to happen in part to try and assist in also uh, some of the requirements around miles in the northern part of the uh, Murray-Darling Basin. So this is a government of vision. This is a government with a plan, and the plan is afoot, and we will be delivering. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is again to the Special Minister of State, and again I refer to text messages exchanged between the Minister and James Ashby on the 29th of March 2012. The Minister sent a text back after James Ashby had assured the Minister copies of the Speaker's official diary would be coming through in minutes, and I quote, thanks. Ashby then sent a text to the Minister, and I quote, we'll need to get daily printouts tomorrow with greater detail. Did the, did the minister receive those unauthorised daily printouts of the speaker's diary? Is conduct of this nature consistent with the standards the government the applies to this minister's time has portfolio? Expired. The minister has the call. Mr. Speaker, um, I actually don't understand what you're just referring to, then. But can I assure you that every yeah, document that left. I have received is in the federal court? The member for Hindmarsh. Yeah. Member for Hindmarsh has the call. Members on my left. Yeah. Member for Hindmarsh has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. What security and screening measures is the government taking member to ensure Gordon. that the 12,000 refugees from Syria coming to Australia are legitimate refugees? Just before I call the, the minister, the member for McEwen has been warned. He will not interject again and remain in the chamber. The Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I want to say thank you very much uh, to the member for Hindmarsh for the question and also for the work that he does uh, on the Backbench Immigration Committee. He has a great interest in making sure that uh, we can continue to grow our nation. And Of course, since the Second World War, we've welcomed to our country 
some 825,000 refugees, people from the four corners of the earth and people that have been able to take that opportunity presented to them and to their family and to contribute to our country in a phenomenal way. And it has been the business of this government to clean up the border protection mess that we were left and we have secured our borders and as a result of that, Mr Speaker, we've been very clear about the fact that it, that enables us to increase the number of people that we will take through the humanitarian and refugee programs. And so with the devastation in Syria and in Iraq, we've announced that we will take 12,000 people from Syria and Iraq and we've done an incredible amount of work in particular with the Syrian leaders in the Christian communities and elsewhere here in our own country to try and identify people, in particular, as the government has made clear on a number of occasions, those that remain our priority, that is women and children, that is people that have been persecuted and indeed those who are very unlikely to be able to return to their place of birth or to their place of residence. And the government has, I think, the most rigorous criteria compared to any other country that has volunteered to take Syrian refugees. We are applying biometric and fingerprint testing. We are working with our Five Eyes partners to access databases and experts within the department to verify the authenticity of documents that people have so that we can be assured that people who are applying under that program are indeed those who are most in need. That is important for a couple of reasons because, firstly, the national security of this nation is the absolute priority of this government and under no circumstance, under no circumstance, Mr Speaker, will we compromise on the national security of this nation. If we find an applicant where we have a suspicion about that person's motivation or their background or their affiliations, that person will not proceed into this program. They will not be coming to this country. Secondly, of course, it is very important to get this right because there are many millions of people who are in need. And by taking people in the program that are not worthy, we are, of course, displacing those people who are most in need. So I thank the member for Hindmarsh and many of those within the coalition and indeed within the parliament who have a serious interest in this matter to make sure that we can get it right, that we can bring people to this country, particularly those from persecuted minorities, including Christians, who will make the greatest opportunity available to them a great success story for their families for generations to come. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I refer to the minister. To, to, my question is to the Special Minister of State. I refer to the minister's answers in question time last week and today. On 29 March 2012, now former journalist Steve Lewis sent an email to the minister, which read, and I quote: "On how many occasions has Peter Slipper travelled to New Zealand since July 2010? Diary extracts. Can these be provided for the following dates?" Did the minister agree to obtain unauthorised copies of the speaker's official diary for a journalist? As a matter of government policy, does the minister now give unauthorised copies of other documents to journalists? The minister has the call. Mr Deputies, uh, Mr Speaker, um, the answer is no. The member for Dawson. Well, thanks, Mr. Speaker. And my constituency question is to the Minister for Resources, Energy, and Northern Australia. Minister, the coal industry is absolutely critical to jobs and economic growth in my electorate of Dawson, and the opening up of the Galilee Basin is crucial to more jobs and more growth locally. Can you please update the House on the importance of coal to the Australian economy and to jobs more generally, and also coal's prospects for the future? I call the Minister for Resources. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I can I thank the member for Dawson for his question and acknowledge his strong advocacy for the resources and energy sector, not just for his constituents, but for Australia at large, and in particular his support for the development of the Carmichael uh, mine, which has the potential to create thousands of jobs and billions of dollars worth of export income, and that even the Labor Party, even the Labor Party has, to be, has described it as a project of great importance to both Queensland and Australia. 
Mr Speaker, the member for Dawson understands that it's not just the jobs in the mines that are created by the coal industry, but it's also the other services and jobs that are created. For example, when I visited uh, Mackay, we went down to GNS Engineering, and that services mining equipment, and it's a very high-tech, innovative business that employs apprentices, among many others. And in the seat of Dawson, you also have the Abbott Point Terminal, which provides hundreds of jobs relating to mining development at the Bowen Basin. Now, the member for Dawson knows as well as anyone else in this place the importance of the coal industry both to Australia and the world. Australia gets more than 60 per cent of its electricity from coal, and globally the world gets more than 40 per cent of its electricity from coal. And the International Energy Agency says that by 2040 that number will still be very significant at 30 per cent, and that the demand for coal in a number of countries continues to rise. Now, for Australia, coal is our second largest export. In 2013-14, it earned around $38 billion worth of export income. And it's, uh, we are the world's second largest exporter of coal. It creates 40,000 jobs directly and more than 100,000 jobs indirectly in Australia. And Australia's coal is predominantly low in sulphur, low in ash, which can be used for these high efficiency, low emission power plants, which we are seeing uh, all around Asia, which can reduce the carbon footprint by up to 40 per cent. And of course, there's other new technology like carbon capture and storage, which will be important to the future of clean coal. Now, the member for Dawson understands how important energy and resources is to his electorate. That's why he recently visited India to promote Australia's coal industry and to speak to Adani and to hand over thousands of postcards from his electorate which said, Mr Adani, we're ready to get working. So, Mr Speaker, the member for Dawson is not only always working hard for his constituents, but he wants to create the opportunities in the resources and energy sector for them to get working hard too. The member for Arzacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is again to the Special Minister of State. I refer to the Minister's answers in question time last week and today. On 29 March 2012, James Ashby sent a text message to the Minister which included pages of the Speaker's official diary. The Minister sent a text back which said, and I quote, Can that be emailed, James? It is hard to read. Mail.bruff2 at bigpond.com. The initial copy he received may have been blurry, but isn't it crystal clear the minister should resign? Yeah. Member for Herbert, will cease interjecting. The minister has the call. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me make it very clear for the honourable member that one, these matters have all been canvassed by the federal court, and the full bench of the federal court actually, actually, members actually, on my left, I say to the. Uh, Deputy Leader, member for Ballarat. actually address this issue, and I and I member invite you to go and have a look at exactly what they had to say. I can further, I further, can, can member for Adelaide and the member for Melbourne Ports will cease interjecting. Member for McMahon is now warned. I would further confirm for the member who continually asks these questions that I at no time passed any diaries to any journalist. Can I be any clearer than that? The member for Barker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Mr. Speaker, my the question member, is: The member for Barker will resume his seat. The member for Bass will cease interjecting. The member for Lingiari will cease interjecting. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I seek leave to table the text exchanges between Mr. Bruff and Mr. Ashby. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. I call the member for Barker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources. Will the minister update the House on new innovations in the wine industry that will support? the integrity of Australian wine in the international marketplace. How will such innovations help to boost winemakers in my electorate and the Australian wine industry more broadly? I call the Minister for Agriculture. Well, um, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question, in fact the 27th question for today. Um, obviously the wine industry, Mr Speaker, has been one that has shown great promise since we have been in government, and we have seen a major turnaround, a major turnaround, a major turnaround, and which has seen since September 2015. Members on my left will contain September themselves. 2015, in the most, in the most recent 12 months, an 8 per cent 
increase to exports of $1.96 billion. $1.96 billion. And Mr. Speaker, this has seen exports, this has seen exports to China rise by 47 per cent to $313 million. And just goes to show you what great work. Uh, how it pays a dividend, the work that we are doing in the free trade agreements, the work we are doing getting protocols in place is actually delivering a better return not only through the farm gate but to the cellar door. And, Mr Speaker, we have also seen wine sales to Canada up by 4 per cent to $189 million, to Hong Kong up by 24 per cent to $118 million. And Mr Speaker, the reason this wine sells is not only because of the hard work that we are doing, the hard work that the free trade agreements have brought about in returns, but also because obviously it is a brilliant product. It is a brilliant product that has been brought together by the hard work and endeavours of so many people in South Australia, in Western Australia, in the Hunter Valley over such a long period of time. Mr Speaker, this work is, uh, is of such a nature that it, it's not surprising that people want to mimic it. And we are doing our very best to make sure that we get the protocols in place so that we own the intellectual property and that it is not counterfeited. But if that is not good enough, there are companies such as Best and Global Food Company, which is now bringing about the forms of tracking so that this product can be tracked all the way through and so that a person with a smartphone device, whether they're buying it in Shanghai or buying it in Hong Kong or buying it in any manner of places across the globe, can check the authenticity of the product they are buying. Because we always know that uh, if you're buying a good bottle of wine, that you want to make sure that it's the authentic ar article, that it actually has come from the Coonawarra, or it has come from uh, McLaren Vale, or it has come uh, from the Colvin, or it has. And, and they're all sticking their hands up now. They're all sticking their hands up. Mergen. It has come from Mergen. Mergen. Probably not as much as come from Mergen as come from McLaren Vale. But, um, but nonetheless, let's not run down Mergen wines. They're very good. Um, and uh, obviously, I've tried some myself from time to time when I run out of money. <laughs> but, but, um, Mr. Speaker, this this is part and parcel of how, even in the wine industry, even in the wine industry, which has been in the depths of despair under the previous government, we are turning it around and we are bringing a better return back through the cellar door for them as well. Mr. Speaker, the I move that further questions be placed on the notice paper. The Leader of the House with paper.